let us pray our god in heaven we thank you for the bible study of today we thank you for the series that we're going through now very important series in the study of the word of god because it's a foundation for our understanding of all other areas and all other parts of the word of god we thank you lord because of the interest you've given us so that we'll study your word know you more love you more and serve you more father we are praying that our coming together to study will be profitable for every one of our lives in jesus name that through this study you will help us to become more matured in understanding matured in following after you matured in doing your will obeying you matured in relationship with you with one another and also matured in understanding of the things that come across our way in the world father we pray as a result of these studies we're having will be more useful in the kingdom of god so that we'll be able to lead others to know you in jesus name we pray O lord that for those who have not seen the importance of the study of the word of god and they have been missing the monday bible study father we pray that you stir them up and you will awaken them so that they will always come and they will study with us so that they too can be strong in the lord in jesus name we pray O lord today that the things that you make us to see make us to hear make us to understand will be definitely profitable for our lives and for our service unto you in jesus name as we come O lord we pray that you open our spiritual eyes open our understanding that we may truly understand what you have for us today and thereby you help us to walk carefully walk prayerfully and be very cautious in our lives so that we do not fall into the trap of the enemy father we pray that you will preserve us spiritually until the coming of the lord we bless your name because we know you have answered in jesus name we pray today we are coming to the third chapter of genesis in our study and really we're making progress now if you have been at the first and the second studies you definitely will say uh, what you didn't know before or what you might be fast forgetting the lord has been good enough to open your eyes and now we are understanding more the chapter that we come to study today is one of the most important in all the words of god why do we say that it's right there on your outline here we see the beginning of a great drama which has been enacted on the stage of human history today it's here that we find the divine explanation of the present falling and ruined condition of the human race in this chapter we learn of the subtle devices of our enemy the devil and we also behold the utter powerlessness of man to walk in the path of righteousness when divine grace is withheld from him when you just uh, have some sober reflection on what i've said to you now you will understand that adam and eve in the state of innocence and perfection in the fullness of grace in the fullness of strength that any created being could ever have yet withdrawn from the lord not depending upon the lord not relying upon the lord looking away from the lord for just a moment i said just a moment you will see how the devil captured them and then they fell into sin what a warning for us today who have been saved who have been sanctified or who are even baptized in the holy ghost because you know there is no experience we have today that will ever make us stronger wiser and better positioned to resist the devil than adam and eve had in their innocent and perfect state yet you can see the utter powerlessness of man 
to walk in the path of righteousness and holiness when divine grace is withheld from such an individual. It's in this chapter we're studying today that we discover the spiritual effects of sin. The spiritual effects of sin. You can see it right here in the chapter as we go to study on Adam and Eve. Man seeking to flee from God. We also discover here the attitude of God toward the guilty sinner. And in this chapter we mark the universal tendency of the human nature to cover up its own moral shame by a device of man's own handiwork. It's in this chapter also we are taught of the gracious provision which God has made to redeem us and to reconcile us unto himself. We learn that man cannot approach God except through a mediator. To some of these deeply important subjects, we shall now give our attention as we're going to consider the uh, whole chapter under four subtitles. Number one, temptation by the tempter. Number two, where art thou? Number three, punishment for transgressors. Number four, the promised seed. Instead of reading through the whole chapter and then going to interpret and explain verse by verse, we'll just uh, take it part by part. And as we take it part by part, that's because of our time, we'll be able to see what lessons the Lord has for every one of us. Every one of us, because we all need the Bible. And we all need all that we're studying here today. Now we're considering number one, point one. Temptation by the tempter. This is an important area of the subject. There will be no hell if there were no temptation. There will be no sin if there were no temptation. There will be no suffering if there were no temptation. And there will be no separation from the Almighty God if there were no temptation. Oh yes, I understand. Temptation is not sin. But sin will not even come if there were no temptation. Therefore, this is very important for pilgrims on their way to heaven. For those who want to understand how to be strong in the Lord and in the power of His mind. For those who want to walk consistently with Almighty God from the point you are born again until the time you see the Lord face to face, this is very important. When does temptation come? How does temptation come? What is the source of temptation? How can we overcome temptation? What are the mistakes and the pitfalls of the people that fall into temptation? If a man or woman has fallen into temptation, what is the way out? Where is the way of escape? Now, Genesis chapter 3, reading from verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now, to start with, uh, you see, as we study the Bible, we study for a number of purposes. One, we study so we can understand for our own personal life. Two, we study so that we'll be able to answer the people that contradict the Bible and the people that will try to confuse us in the Word of God. Three, we study so that we'll be able to effectively, convincingly teach other people who are ignorant but they're willing to know the word of God. The number one thing we want to settle here. It says it was the serpent that actually spoke to Eve and said, as God said. Now, when you look at uh, the situation today and you see that a serpent cannot talk to, cannot communicate with anybody today, you say, how can that be true? Are you forgetting something? That they, at this time that we're living now, curse has been upon the animal kingdom, upon the vegetation kingdom, that is upon all the plants, upon all the forests, upon the ground, upon everything that you see on the face of the earth. At that time, the curse was not there. At that time, there was no, there was no barrier. 
in communication between that serpent, I mean the real animal, and Eve. But then another thing you need to understand is that behind that serpent, within that serpent, and underneath that serpent, something, someone motivating, instigating, and pushing that serpent to do what that serpent did is the devil. Which means, in the real sense, the devil, called Satan, used that serpent to be able to talk unto Eve. You know what I'm saying? When Eve saw that serpent, you didn't see Satan. All that she saw was that a serpent was talking to her and to her. It was a normal conversation. I'll bring a lesson out of that for you uh, later. But look at this now in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 2. Revelation chapter 20 verse 2. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent. You see that? Old serpent. What does that mean? As old as Genesis chapter 3. As old as the beginning of the creation. As old as the time when this earth had only two people alive on it. Adam and Eve. The old serpent, which is the devil and Satan and bound him a thousand years. Which means then it was Satan. It was the devil instigating or influencing or making that serpent to say what the serpent said. So ultimately, the tempter is the devil. The tempter is the devil. In Isaiah chapter 27, reading from verse 1. In that day, the Lord with a sword and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. Now you see the, the names that were used, or the titles that were used for Satan in the passage I read to you in Revelation. Two names, the serpent and the dragon. And you find that same thing here. Now what we're learning from here is this, that the devil was the one that transformed himself unto that serpent that is motivated and moved that serpent as the devil stopped doing that today well in a way he doesn't uh, make uh, the uh, serpent now to talk to a man why oh yes because now the generality of men they fear serpents they fear snakes it will be useless now it will not be wisdom and you know the devil is very clever and very subtle the devil is not going to use a lion to talk to you today because no you are not friendly with the lion it's not going to use a leopard it's not going to use a tiger it's not going to use a serpent either it's going to now use an individual you remember when jesus was saying that he was going to the cross now the devil didn't use a serpent at that time you know who he used the closest or one of the closest of the disciples of jesus christ a follower a disciple a friend a person that could easily communicate a person familiar enough with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Peter just took hold of Jesus Christ and said, That will not happen unto you. And Jesus recognized. I hope you recognize when your own temptation comes. And Jesus recognized that that was Satan. And he said, Get thee behind me, Satan. Listen to me. It was Peter speaking. But influenced by Satan. Motivated by Satan. And led by Satan pushed by Satan to say what he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and in verse 3. But I fear, lest by any means, as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Paul the Apostle said, I fear, because temptations, when temptation began in the Garden of Eden, since that time, listen to me, since that time, temptation has been every day in the human race. Right now, as I'm talking, somebody somewhere is being tempted by the devil to look the wrong direction, to say the wrong thing, 
to take the wrong decision, to go the forbidden way, to eat the forbidden thing, to drink the forbidden thing. Somebody somewhere in the world is being tempted to do what is contrary to the will of God. Since that time, temptation has been the common experience. Not everybody yields to temptation. Not everybody falls under temptation, yet there are multitudes of people that are yielding to temptation. Every time, and so Paul the Apostle said, I fear, lest by any means, in the same way that the serpent beguiled, deceived Eve, through a subtlety, so your mind shall be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. In verse 14, and no marvel. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. What does that mean? It means that today, when the devil wants to tempt a man, a woman, a boy, or a girl, he'll transform himself into an angel of light. He'll come like a counselor. Will come like a, a person that is benevolent, like a friend, like a well-wisher. That like a person that is just thinking about your convenience, thinking about your progress, thinking about what you need to have. And let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. And now we're looking at it from verse 1 again. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, as God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden here we find the devil coming in a very subtle way i said devil because i believe that is clear to you now that anytime there is temptation whatever the agent whatever the avenue whatever the channel whatever the means that the devil is using behind that temptation supporting that temptation underneath that temptation the very foundation of that temptation is the devil himself and now uh, there may be somebody over there that is saying thank god i'm above temptation nobody is above temptation you know that adam the innocent the perfect one Eve, the innocent, the perfect one, they were not free. Well, let's even look away from Adam and Eve for some moment. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Redeemer, our Lord, the captain of our salvation. The Bible tells us very clearly he was tempted. He was tempted. And you know what the Bible says? It says the servant cannot be above his master. And I don't care about your Christian experience, whoever you are. One thing I know about you, you may be saved, that's wonderful. Sanctified, that's wonderful. Baptized in the Holy Ghost, that's wonderful. You are strong in the Lord, that's wonderful. You know the Bible, I praise the Lord for you. But one thing I know about you, you are not yet above the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are a Christian, if you are a Christian, you can only be a follower of Jesus Christ. You can only be behind Jesus Christ. You are following. And therefore you are not above the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore it will be error on your part or on anybody's part. To say, thank God because of the Christian experiences I've got. Because of my experience. Because of my determination. Because of my all the things I've got in the Lord. I cannot be tempted. You will be tempted. Not only that you can be tempted, you will be tempted to look the wrong direction, to take a wrong decision, and to act in the wrong way. You don't have to yield to that temptation, but you will be tempted in Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, verse 40. The disciple is not above his master. The disciple is not above his master. So then, if he was tempted, you will be tempted too. Was Jesus tempted? Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, verse 3. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Temptation came to the Lord Jesus Christ. Who was responsible for that temptation? Luke chapter 4, verse 13. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season, not permanently. 
I told you, temptation is always there. It, it comes now, you overcome. It comes later again. You overcome, it comes later again. Until we close our eyes in death. Until the trumpet sounds and we fly away from this world, temptation will never cease. It's just on and on and on. Because, you know, the devil never gives up. He may, he'll say, I'll try this once again. Maybe I can draw him away from the path to heaven and draw him to hell. The Bible says here, when the devil, the devil is a tempter, had ended all the temptation, he departed from him permanently no, constantly no, forever no, for a season, for a season. Now, we know that if Jesus Christ was tempted and he overcame, he is able to succor. Is able to support, is able to help all the people that are being tempted even today. And therefore we know that is able to help you. All I'm pointing out is that temptation will come. And I point that out to you so that you'll be able to get ready. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 from verse 15. For we have not an high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin he was tempted in all points and he was tempted as we are in all points yet without sin in hebrews chapter 2 hebrews chapter 2 verse 18 for in that he himself has suffered being tempted he is able to succor them that are tempted is able to strengthen you able to give you that strength and power to resist the devil and to resist all his temptations let's go back to genesis chapter 3 now i'm going to uh, share with you the method that the devil often uses let's now go to chapter 3 of genesis from verse 1 again i'm reading from the middle now and he said unto the woman yea as god said Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden, as God said. Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now you see what the devil did here. He represented the commandment of God in a fallacious manner, creating doubt in the necessity of God's commandment. And it's creating doubt in the wisdom of God, in the love of God. That's what the devil always does. He'll question you. This your condition. This your situation. Is God really thinking about you? That's the very beginning of temptation. And uh, this trial you've been making and you've never made it, do you think God really loves you? That's the beginning of temptation. This commandment of God how reasonable it is, how necessary it is. After all, that's the very beginning of temptation. This restriction, what God has forbidden, that we shouldn't touch, we shouldn't eat, we shouldn't drink, we shouldn't go in that direction, how necessary really it is. How compatible with the love of God and the wisdom of God and the liberty of the Christian. You know, that, that's, going, that's what the devil is going to say. How much liberty do you really have if you cannot go to the dancing hall? If you cannot gamble? If you cannot, you know, touch a woman? If you cannot do this? If you cannot marry whoever you like? How much liberty do you really have? You know, it's going to question, do you think you really have liberty? It's representing the commandment of God, the word of God in a very bad way. So that you'll begin to think, really, do I have liberty? Really, am I a free individual? Now, Eve made a mistake. The mistake is even to begin discussing that thing. Discussing that thing. You know, you make a mistake when somebody comes and you begin to discuss with that individual. The fellow you know really wants to uh, make you fall. Make you disobey the Lord. Make you yield unto temptation. But it will come almost like an innocent thing at the beginning. And as soon as you get into that conversation, remember, you are not wiser than the devil. Can I tell you something? The devil has had almost 6,000 years in which to learn the most subtle method. To tempt the hearts of men away from the Lord. I mean, he did it with Eve. 
my, my beloved sister, listen to me. There is no woman on the face of the earth today that will be wiser than that first woman, than Eve, because that woman was created without any flaw, without any depravity, without any corruption, without any forgetfulness, without any kind of limitation in her understanding. And if that intelligent woman, wise woman, perfect woman, innocent woman, got into this scene by just allowing herself to discuss with the representative of the devil, do you think you are wise, sir? Do you think you are greater? Do you think that you can manage yourself, you can manage your way, that you will not be able to? And my beloved brother there, I praise the Lord if you are strong. I praise the Lord if you are born again. I praise the Lord if you are sanctified. I praise the Lord if you are dedicated, devoted, committed, consecrated unto the Lord. You are the kind of people I love. But uh, in the love I have for you, I must still ask you a question. Are you wiser than Adam? Are you stronger than Adam? Are you more innocent than Adam? Are you more perfect than Adam? Are you more intelligent than Adam? You know, in all that innocency and perfection, Yet, you can see what happened unto him. What I'm saying is, we'll need to walk carefully. And walk prayerfully. And just fear, lest we ourselves will be led away into corruption and into sin. Now, let's see in verse 2. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now, as we study this, I want to plead with you that even though we are studying about the fall, and we are studying about the sin that Eve committed and Adam committed, yet, you know, at the time, listen to me, at the time that Eve said what she said in verses 2 and 3, she had not committed sin yet. She was still operating in the wisdom that God had given her. She was still operating in the holiness, in the righteousness, in the perfection, in the innocence that God had given her. You know, she had not sinned yet. She had not eaten the forbidden fruit. Therefore, what she said just now that we have read together, you must see the wisdom in it. You know, there are some people that study the Bible. And uh, anytime they read these things that uh, Eve had said, they will look at it as if, after all, uh, this is a sinner talking. No, she has not committed sin yet. Not committed sin yet. Still innocent and still perfect. Now let us learn from what she said. What did she say? She said, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now we learned something here. Eve was uh, saying, God has said, don't eat. And if you are not going to eat, there's no point in touching it. Isn't that reasonable? Isn't that reasonable? If you are not going to eat, there is no point touching it. No point touching it. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them. And be ye separate, says the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing. Please, my brother, my sister, underline it in your Bible. Touch not the unclean thing. Touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. You know what? If uh, you are not going to gamble, why are you touching that coupon? If you are not going to go into immorality, why are you touching that magazine that is so polluted with uh, pictures of naked women or naked men? If you are not going to drink that marijuana, why are you asking where they are selling it? If you are not going to drink uh, that beer, why are you carrying the bottle? If you are not going to commit that adultery, that fornication with that man, why are you touching the letter, the bad letter, the evil letter, and the suggestive letter that that man has written to you? If you are not going to go into that evil relationship, you as a boy or you as a girl, why are you even having any thought concerning being a boyfriend, being a girlfriend? You know the point is this. If you are not going to eat it, why are you touching it? Why are you looking at it? Why are you considering it? 
Because, you know, in the wisdom that God had given to Eve, Eve said, God has said, you will not eat thereof, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. You know, it is the touching that leads to the taking, that leads to the eating, that leads to the sin. It is the meditating on it. And looking upon it, and examining it, and evaluating it, and uh, touching it, and looking at all those bad, bad pictures that eventually will lead a person into the evil thing. Let's look at First Thessalonians, First Thessalonians, chapter five and verse twenty-two. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Not only the evil itself. Oh yes, the evil is bad. Bad enough that you shouldn't do it. You shouldn't do it. Abstain from the evil. Do not commit evil. Do not commit sin. But it goes beyond that. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Now, I want to talk to you, uh, young women, and maybe some of you old women as well. Uh, you know this catalog that people carry about? You know, this kind of dress and that kind of dress. You know, you will not wear slacks. Why are you then examining how fitting the slacks are? You know, I saw it in a paper and it says the modern style. Why are you examining it? Why are you touching it? Why are you thinking about it? Why are you thinking, I used to wear this. I used to look like this. I used to look like that. Why are you looking at it? And young man, let me ask you this. You know that the Bible says you must not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And being some believer, a woman has sent her photograph to you and said well i just want to send this photograph to you, photograph to you and uh, you say well i'm not going to marry her i know i'm a christian i will never marry an unbeliever and you take the photograph and you look at her and you keep the photograph of all places to keep the photograph even in your bible think about it the photograph of an unbeliever the photograph of a temptress, the photograph of a person, an agent of the devil, be used of the devil to pull you down and to drag you into hell. And you put that photograph into your Bible so that every time you, every time you have quiet time in the morning, you'll see the photograph of the agent of Satan. You see that? You see that? You will not eat it and you will not touch it. That's what we're learning from the word of God. Be careful. That if you don't want to eat that sin, if you do not want to go into sin, if you are not going to practice evil, stay at a very great distance from that sin. Let's go on. In Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. I'm reading now from verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. That's always the lie of the devil. Ye shall not surely die. That's always the deception of the devil. Ye shall not surely die. For God does know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. And ye shall know, ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. I'm going to ask you a question. God created Adam and Eve. And he created the whole of the universe. And he planted the garden of Eden. Didn't God love Adam and Eve? He said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make an help meet for him. Didn't God think about the need of the life of Adam? And then made this woman and brought her unto, unto the man. And the man said, this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she has been taken out of man. And then God will come to visit them in the cool of the day. Didn't God love Adam and Eve? Now, Satan, this is the insinuation. This is the suggestion. And this is the deception. This is the very temptation. Satan said, now I'm interpreting it, God doesn't really love you. He's not thinking well about you. He doesn't want your advantage. He knows that when, if you eat of that thing, you'll be wise. He doesn't want you to be wise. You'll be knowledgeable. He doesn't want you to be knowledgeable. And life will have real fulfillment. Because, you know, you'll just become omnipotent like God. Omniscient like God. Omnipresent like God. You'll just be like God. And you will know anything, everything, everywhere, taking place, anytime. And that was the bait. You know, that's what the devil will always do. Suggesting to you, does God love you? Does Christ love you? Does the church really love you? And in the midst of the brethren where you are, do you really fit in? Are you not missing something out of life? 
Are you not being denied something that, you know, if you will, that's what the devil will say. If you go into that thing, if you touch that thing, if you partake of that thing, you will be wise, you will be knowledgeable, and you will know what you didn't know before. That's the same bait the devil is still using today. He'll come to present something to you. He'll come to present a book to you. And he'll present this secret cult unto you. And he will say, you know, you Christians, you don't really understand. And you do not have the hidden power, the latent power that God used in Jesus Christ. And if you will join this society, you'll be initiated into this society. And you begin to read the material. And you begin to think about it. Ah, you will discover something hidden you have never seen something that is latent and great you have never seen and you know if you eat of that thing and you see that thing and you read that occultic material power you will have power and there you have gone and you will say uh-huh something that the church has never told us that's what they said something god has never told us something god didn't want us to partake in that's how he fell into the thing it is just the method of the devil and that is still the same method that the devil is using today the devil is a deceiver the devil is a deceiver and be not ignorant of the wiles of the strategy of the devil i'm reading to you now from second corinthians chapter 2 2nd Corinthians chapter 2 and I'm reading from verse 11 lest Satan should get an advantage of us for we are not ignorant of his devices we are not ignorant of his devices he will deceive and it will lure an individual into sin we now go back to Genesis chapter 3 verses 6 and 7 and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise she took of the fruit thereof and she did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat and the eyes of them both were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons now the devil eventually won the battle listen through the eyes when the woman saw when the woman saw it's never advantageous my brother for you to look at what the devil is pointing your attention to never see it never look at it ask yourself from where is that book coming if it's coming from this uh, from the devil the originator the source of it the foundation of it is the devil don't even bother to read it why is that false doctrine where is that false doctrine coming from if it is coming from an agent of satan don't even bother to see it and you know sometimes uh, you as you go on the street you'll find some of these uh, women uh, you know where they are coming from you know who is their master you know what is instigating them they are almost half naked half naked and the devil will, after, you know, bringing them on the street or bringing them in the bus, the devil will say, look at that. It's never advantageous to look at an object of temptation. You know, the problem that David had is that as he was walking at the pavement, he saw a woman washing herself and just seeing the nakedness of that woman that did the job. Now the next point was to send and take the woman. Do you remember just a few weeks ago we studied about Achan? And in the confession of Achan, Achan said, When I saw the goodly Babylonish garment, you know, that's the point. Then he said, I took it. When you see, that's the point. That's the point. You must make sure that you do not allow yourself to see. And if you see it accidentally, just once, that's why you have eyelids, you close your eyes, you turn away your eyes. In fact, you have to make a covenant with your eyes that you will not behold, you will not think of something evil. In Job chapter 31, Job chapter 31, reading from verse 1, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? Well, we know that Job particularly here was talking about women. That is, he as a man, 
not wanting to look upon a maid that might become a temptress. Now, you are a woman, perhaps. If you are a woman, it means that a man too can be a temptation to you. If you look in a particular way, you look in a particular direction, and you look at things you shouldn't look at on the man, that can be a temptation also. So, uh, you as a woman, you will need to make a covenant with your eyes. Why then should you think on, gaze upon, in a tempting manner, in a way that will get you into trouble? Why then should you think upon a maid? But then, let me now go deeper than that. And take out a principle from here. If alcohol happens to be uh, something, a big temptation, a big arrow, that uh, the devil may just shoot at you, wanting you to, uh, you know, drink that thing, why should you look upon the bottle? If, for example, uh, before you were born again, you have been taking Indian ham, and you have been taking drugs, hard drugs, to destroy your life, and now you are born again, you know that that is a, a place where the devil may want to trick you and just make you to look at that thing. Why then should you think about it and look upon it? Or it may be that you are a gambler before. And uh, every time you see all this coupon table and everything, it will just tempt you. It will just tempt you. Why then should you even look at that coupon? Or it may be that in the past, uh, you know, da dancing and drinking and merrymaking and nightclub and theater and film show, pop houses, that was a real terrible sin in your life. Now you are born again. And when you are passing in front of that place, why should you look inside? Why should you look at that thing? Now, my sister, look up now. Sister, you know that uh, you were a girlfriend to that man before. And you know all that you discussed together. I mean, you were moving for years, going on for years. And you saw one another so intimately. Eventually, you became a believer. Now that you are born again, you just say, Oh Lord, I know this is hard, but I want to get to heaven. I will not marry an unbeliever. And so, uh, you just made up your mind, and you wrote her off, you cut, you cut him off rather, and you say, No, I'm sorry, I cannot marry you. I now want to go with Jesus Christ. And now, and now, all the letters that he wrote to you before, in those bad days of sin, of sinful communication, if you go to pick them up again, and you are reading them, and you are reading them, isn't that a source of temptation? Now, why don't you make a covenant with your eyes that you will not behold those things anymore? Young man, let me speak to you. You had a girlfriend before, and you saw one another intimately. You discussed intimately. And uh, she's got a photograph in your album and photograph, uh, uh, you know, on your wall and photograph on your desk, on your table. Now you say you are born again. And you have heard the word of God. You must not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And therefore you are reaching to us saying, I'm sorry. We cannot go on together again. But listen to me. Privately, you still keep those photographs. Maybe the photographs are no more on the wall. Maybe it's no more on your table, but it's in the wardrobe. And it's in the drawer. And every time, and you are still looking at that thing. Don't you know that you don't make a covenant with your eyes? You have not made a covenant with your eyes already. You must make a covenant with your eyes that no, I will not behold. I will not see all those objects of temptation. If there is anything that has been a temptation to you in the past, if there is anywhere you have discovered a very weak point in your life, here is what to learn, that you will make a covenant with your own heart, a covenant with your own eyes, that you will not behold any of those things. And so, uh, that is what we learn. Let me uh, draw out another principle. Boyfriend, girlfriend is what you have been carrying on before. And uh, my sister, this man, an unbelieving man, had bought a lot of things for you. Is it scarf? Is it dress? Is it shoe? Is it socks? Is it a lot of things? And you know, books that she had, he had bought for you before. And he will write in that book and say uh, to my uh, loving uh, so and so, I will write his name. And then you know, say you are now born again. You are a child of God now. And you have said, No, I don't want uh, to go along with you anymore. And every time you are still looking at those books, you say, oh, these books. When, when this man traveled to America, and when he went to Britain, and when he went to all these places where you find encyclopedia, you find this, you find this, all these books that I need, and you are still reading them, you will fall into temptation. 
and it is the shoe that she, he bought that was still using and the scarf and the dress and everything that the man used uh, as long as you see that thing you are seeing what represents the man you are seeing what represents his love is lost towards you what should you do oh you will get rid of them you'll get rid of them if you really mean that you have cut off that boy or that man you will all the things that the man are done for you you will you will give up everything and say i give it to you i'm going to go a step further and you know i, I don't want us to deceive ourselves and the people of the world are wiser than many of us think. You know, it may be that when you are boyfriend, girlfriend, the man may be so rich that he even built a house for you. And as a man was so rich that he built a house for you, then you said, well, uh, I don't want to continue with you. I want to be a Christian now. The man said, all right, that's all right to be a Christian. Uh, and then the house uh, that uh, you built uh, for me before what are we going to do about it now well the man may say i love you that how can i take the house away from you well you don't love me you don't want to go along with me that's the way you want to treat me i will not treat you like that you go with the house i give you the house no house rent nothing at all you say you don't like me again but you need the house go with the house eh? i praise the lord god has provided for me provided for you provided for you the man wants you to be thinking about him that every time you live in that house you'll be thinking ah but see how good this man is even a non-believer and the devil will be making you to think and say well you see uh, or even believers show me a believer in your district show me a believer in this whole church who can build a whole house for you and tell you to go away with it without even marrying you can any christian do that don't you know this man is better than all the christian in the whole church that's a bitch that's what the devil is going to use but if you are going to pack to a single room you will tell that man i understand what you are saying i appreciate what you are saying but in my conscience i cannot take it in my conscience i cannot take it I belong to the Lord Jesus Christ now and the Lord will not allow me to be able to have that and you know when Eve saw it thought about it and then said it was good for food and pleasant to the eyes then she desired it so as to make herself wise and she took of the fruit thereof and she did eat as soon as she ate she also became a temptress herself an agent of Satan herself that's always the pattern that's always the pattern once you fall into sin you are going to also be an agent of satan to make other people to fall now we're going to go to point two point two is where art thou where art thou i'm reading from verse eight and here are the voice of the lord god walking in the garden in the cool of the day and adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. That's the very effect of sin. Now, as you look at this passage, you will see, number one, shame covered them. That's in verse 7. When their eyes were opened, then they knew that they were naked. And because of that shame, they had to sow fig leaves to cover themselves. And then in verse 8, they were now running away from God, hiding themselves from the Lord. Not only that, we see the sense of guilt, the sense of shame. They had lost the good state in which they were before. And now there was the conviction of sin. And the appearance of God, the approach of God was no more to them the approach of the Creator, the approach of the Father, the approach of a friend, the approach of a lover, the approach of somebody taking care of them. It was the approach of a judge. And because now that's what they thought about God, and truly that's who God is now to them, that's who God was now to them, fright or terror seized upon them. That is the very uh, essence of sin. That is what sin will do. Now, you see, they heed themselves. And that is what people will do when they have committed sin. In Job chapter 34 verse 22. Job chapter 34 verse 22. There is no darkness, nor shadow of death, where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. If you do it, you are just trying in vain. There is no shadow. There is no darkness. 
wherewith the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. But you know, once a person has uh, committed sin, it is clear, it is plain. And uh, maybe you have often heard that secret sins that men commit, they are open scandals in the presence of God, in the sight of heaven. There is no way a sinner can hide himself. You know, once you have committed sin, you know what happens? You become shallow, you become empty, and you become so light, you become so confused, and you feel the sense of shame and guilt that people looking at you, they will know something has gone wrong. Something has gone wrong. The person that was joyful and buoyant before, you'll see that the person now is so dull, is so ashamed, is so unhappy. There is no confidence now. He cannot talk straight anymore. You will even think that everybody has known. Because, you see, that is a very consequence of sin. In Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 24. Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 24. Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him? Says the Lord, do not I feel heaven? And earth, says the Lord, that means then, we cannot hide ourselves. They tried, but they tried in vain. In Hebrews chapter 4, Hebrews chapter 4, reading from verse 13, the only thing we can do is to confess that sin, is to come before the Lord, apologize, repent, and forsake the sin. And so, Lord, I know that this is what I've done. And I know that with this sin will come the judgment of God if I don't repent. And repent before the Lord. Don't try to hide it. You steal money, don't try to try, uh, don't try to hide it. And uh, you are committing adultery, fornication, don't try to hide it. You cannot hide before the Lord. Heaven has seen it already. And the Lord is asking, what's the condition now? What's the spiritual condition now? Where art thou? Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. All things are open. All things are naked unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. That means we cannot hide ourselves. Unfortunately, our, our, our parents, our first parents, instead of confessing, they began to lay the blame on other people, on others. In Genesis chapter 3, let's see their response. Verse 9. Genesis chapter 3 from verse 9. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? The Lord was asking, Adam, where art thou? Couldn't God see Adam? Oh yes, they could see him. Didn't he know his uh, present, uh, where he was, uh, hiding under, in, inside in, in that place? God knew. But then he said, Where art thou? Now God was really asking, now that you have done the sin you shouldn't have done, now that you have eaten the forbidden fruit, what's your condition now? Where are you spiritually now? I created you in a perfect state. How are you now? I created you with righteousness and innocency. Where are you now? I created you to be able to have fellowship with me. Where are you now? The same question the Lord is asking you today. If you have gone into sin, private sin, secret sin, and you think that people do not know, the question is, where art thou now? Where art thou? You were saved before, where art thou now? Your name was written in the book of life. What's your condition now? Where is your name now? Where art thou? Uh, you, you were a gentle person before, walking in the laws of God before, but now you, you fought with your wife, you fought with your husband. Where art thou? Now you've gone back to drink uh, that uh, a gin or to drink uh, uh, that beer. Where art thou now? Now you, you begin to smoke and you are covering up with uh, a peppermint or whatever just to, or with the uh, mouth pressure. But where art thou now? Where are you? Where are you? That was a question God was asking Adam. What he should have done is just to fall upon his face and to just uh, plead and to pray and to cry. But he didn't. And what you can do today? After you have sinned, after you are backsliding, after you have missed your way with the Lord, it's just to pray unto the Lord and say, Oh Lord, here am I, I have committed sin, and I want you to forgive me. But they were placing blame. In verse 10, 
And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? As thou eating of the tree, whereof I, com I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat. And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Instead of confessing their sins, all they did now was to place the blame on, other, on others. Adam placed the blame on Eve. Eve placed the blame on the serpent. And since that time, all the descendants of Adam, all children of Adam, offspring of Adam, they have followed that same footsteps in trying to place the blame of their sins upon another person. But can we really do it? No, we can't and escape. You know, Aaron placed the blame on the children of Israel. When Moses said, Aaron, why have you done this? In that you have made an idol for the people to follow. Oh, yes, he said, you know, it's not my fault. You know, these people that they would have stoned me. And actually, when I told them to bring all their earrings, I, I took it and uh, put it into the furnace, and this one just came out. The same excuse Saul was making. And Saul said, well, I've done what the Lord wanted me to do, but the people of the land, they took Agag and they took all the sheep. You see, laying blame on others. But actually, do you have any excuse if you have committed sin? You knew the Bible. You knew the standard of the word of God. You had the blood of Jesus covering you. You had the warning of the Spirit of God. Do you have any excuse if you have gone into sin? No, they are without excuse. Romans chapter 1 verse 20. Romans chapter 1 verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So that they are without excuse. You are without excuse. You cannot say, it was that lady that made me to fall. You are without excuse. It was because I didn't have any job I had to go and steal. You are without excuse. You know, I was uh, planning my marriage and there was no money for me to uh, actually get uh, into the marriage and to pay dowry. And therefore, because of that poverty, something pushed me to steal money. You are without excuse. Well, the people actually did not visit me and to follow me up. And so when temptation came, I was so, I was so weak. You are without excuse. In Romans chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whoever thou art that judges, for wherein thou judgest another thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same things. You know, if you are a preacher yourself, preaching the word of God, if you are leading other people yourself, according to the word of God, maybe you are a school visitor, maybe you are checking up on these uh, young people, say so you are following them up, and eventually you commit sin with them. Eventually you, you attend to do something evil. You are without excuse because you seem to know the word and yet you fell into that thing. Let's go to point three. Punishment for transgressors. Punishment came. Punishment came. Punishment will always come. Always the punishment will come. Let's see it now from Genesis chapter 3 and verse 14. Genesis chapter 3 from verse 14. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly thou shalt go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Number one, punishment came on the serpent, I mean the real snake, I mean the animal, the agent of the devil in the temptation. From that, please learn that when you yield yourself into the hands of the devil and you become an agent of Satan to tempt others, to make others fall, 
the judgment of God will be upon you as well. Now, verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head. The seed of the woman will bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. That is the punishment that also came on the devil, on Satan, on the one that instigated the serpent. He is referred to here as the seed of that serpent, as the one inside supporting, influencing, motivating, bringing the thought into uh, the into the serpent to actually do it. And you know. The, the judgment has also come upon the devil. I'm sure you know that. That judgment has come upon the devil. And the devil will suffer forever and ever. Not only because of this, but because he tried to raise his throne above that of God. And he tried to usurp the place of God. And because of that, he was cast out. All that is waiting for now is eternal punishment. Eternal suffering in the lake of fire. In Revelation chapter 20 verse 10 Revelation chapter 20 verse 10 And the devil that deceived them Was cast into the lake of fire And brimstone The devil that deceived them Will eventually be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone Let's go back to Genesis chapter 3 Verse 16 Unto the woman he said I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception in sorrow thou shalt bring forth that uh, thou shalt bring forth children and thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee again we see that punishment came upon the woman can you see everyone that had part in that temptation in that sin in the fall everyone that had any part at all shared in the road in the indignation and in the suffering it is still the same today god is still a judge and though hands be joined with hands the wicked the sinner the one that yields to temptation is going to be punished in proverbs chapter 11 proverbs chapter 11 verse 21 though hand join in hand the wicked shall not be unpunished the wicked will be punished will be punished the wicked shall not be unpunished. Look at verse 19. As righteousness tendeth to life, so he that pursueth evil, pursueth it to his own death. Judgment will come. Judgment will come. The Bible says very clearly, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Judgment will definitely come. Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 4. Ezekiel 18 verse 4. Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Romans chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. But unto them that are contentious, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, what will happen to them? Indignation and wrath. Verse 9, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. Judgment came upon the serpent, upon the devil, upon the woman, now upon the man as well. Genesis chapter 3 from verse 17. And unto Adam, he said, because thou art akin to the voice of of thy wife. Thou was hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. Let me stop here for a moment. You know, uh, there are some people that misunderstand the teaching of the word of God on marriage. And therefore they do not have the right attitude. The thing that all we are saying when we are teaching on marriage is that you love that woman. You never displease that woman. Whatever she says, whatever she wants, whatever she wants you to do, just go ahead and do it. And therefore they will say, well, because of what we have been taught on marriage, whatever the woman tells me, I will have to do. Not if she tells you to commit sin. Not if she tells you to eat the forbidden fruit. 
Not if she gives you something like false doctrine. Not if she says, let us go to the abalis. Let us go to the false prophet. You see, God told Adam, because thou was akin to the voice of thy wife, you should lead your home. Be the head of your home. The woman is a weaker vessel. And she can easily be maybe deceived. And you are the person as the man. As the one that has authority to say, my wife, you are wrong. This is the word of God. You are the high priest in your home. You are the minister in your home. You are the leader, the controller, the director in your home. And you shouldn't ever yield to the temptation coming from your wife saying, Well, because my wife said it, my wife said, Let us go and visit Abalis, and uh, I don't want to displease her. Judgment will come on you because you are disobeying the word of God. You are being led astray by your wife. You must be very careful. You do not allow whether husband or wife or child or anyone to deceive you and to make you go into sin now let's go on verse 17 and unto adam he said because thou was hearkening unto the voice of thy wife and as eating of the tree of the which i commanded thee saying thou shalt not eat of it cursed is the ground for thy sake in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the all thy days all the days of thy life thorns also and tissues shall, shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it was thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto the dust thou shalt return. And I am called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth a son and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword. We turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Here we can see the punishment that came upon him, that is, upon Adam. And today we must understand that the judgment of God will be fiery upon the people that live in sin and continue in sin. In this world, there will be punishment. And even after death, there will be punishment as well. Let's look at Revelation. Revelation chapter 14, verses 10 and 11. Revelation 14, verses 10 and 11. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and it shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. You, you see there, judgment, eternal perdition, eternal punishment is awaiting the people that live in sin and die in sin. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 15, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Revelation chapter 21 verse 8. For the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the allmongers and the sorcerers and the idolaters and all last shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. You see there is punishment, eternal punishment, everlasting punishment. For the people that live in sin and die in sin without repenting. Now let's go to uh, Genesis chapter 3 again. The question is, is there any hope today? That if a person is in sin, 
that he can still be forgiven. Is there any hope today that that person can be redeemed? That that person can be saved? That the sins can be forgiven? That we can have peace with God? That there can be a way of destroying the works of the devil in our lives? I want to tell you that our God is a great God. A God of love. Great in mercy. Great in love. Great in understanding and great in the provision he has made for us and in the plan of redemption. Do you know that in Genesis chapter 3, right at the point when man had fallen and had lost the favor of God and had lost every good thing that God had given and had become a slave, a servant of Satan and a slave of sin, God made a way to receive forgiveness and to be reconciled with God. It's in this uh, Genesis chapter 3, look at it. That leads me to point 4, the promised seed. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. Her seed, the seed of the woman. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. That is a prophecy of the scriptures. Once again, can I remind you that the Bible is a wonderful book. And the fulfillment of this prophecy to the letter shows us that the word of God is true from cover to cover. Here is uh, what God is saying here. He said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. And the seed of the woman will bruise thy head referring to the seed of the woman we know that that is the messiah because you see this verse here reaching into this dark picture of sin sheds a beam of light for lost humanity it's in this verse that we have revealed the mercy of god and a plan of redemption here is what we learn that no sooner did the father call and god disclosed the way back to the father's heart to the father's presence to the father's house this is the first verse of scripture pointing to Christ as a redeemer of men, so that through him the image will lost by the fall will be restored and regained as he comes into our lives. Here is a promised Messiah called the seed of the woman. Because you see in the fullness of time in his incarnation, Jesus was born of a virgin. That's why it's referred to here as the seed of the woman. As God had said, Satan bruised Christ's heel on the cross when Jesus was crucified for the sins of the world. But Satan's head was bruised when Jesus defeated him on the cross of Calvary. One day, the Lord will complete that conquest for the devil and death and hell will all be cast into the lake of fire to be tormented day and night forever and ever. Let's look at this prophecy so closely and so intimately for the few minutes we have ahead of us. In Isaiah chapter 7, Isaiah chapter 7, reading from verse 14. Isaiah 7, verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive, and bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. A virgin shall conceive, and that virgin will bear a son. That son is Emmanuel, the seed of the woman. In Matthew chapter 1, Matthew chapter 1, reading from verse 21, And she shall bring forth a son. And thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son. And thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So then, Jesus is the seed of the woman. And you know that the devil bruised his heel on a cross. He was crucified. They pierced him. They pierced his hand. They pierced his feet. And they pierced his side. That's the fulfillment of Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. But then remember 
that the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the devil. Bruise the head of the devil. Destroy the works of the devil completely. Hebrews chapter 2 verses 14 and 15. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death, that's Jesus Christ raised death on the cross of Calvary, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject unto bondage. Now we can be delivered from all the works of Satan. In First John chapter 3 verse 8. First John chapter 3 verse 8. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested. That he might destroy the works of the devil. That he might destroy the works of the devil. Glory be to God. That even at that time of the fall. God made the provision. Whereby you and I can be saved. Whereby all the offspring and all the children of Adam and Eve. Can come back to him. And be reconciled unto him. The question I have for you is. What should God do that he has not done? In making a way back to himself. In planning our redemption. In offering to us is grace and forgiveness and peace of mind. In offering to us, you know, we lost the Garden of Eden. But he's prepared now something greater, something better, something richer than the Garden of Eden. He has prepared heaven even for us. Jesus said, that is our Redeemer. The seed of the woman, he said, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Be a place better than the Garden of Eden. A place better than what we have lost. I go to prepare a place for you. Now Adam and Eve lost relationship with God. That relationship with God is available today through the seed of the woman. Adam and Eve lost that righteousness and that perfection and that holiness because of the fall. That holiness, that righteousness that they lost is available today through the seed of the woman. And today you can call upon the Lord. Look at your life. See what you have lost. See the way you have gone astray. And you can call upon the Lord and say, Oh Lord, I praise your name. Because of your provision. Because of what you have done. And because of what you have provided in the Lord Jesus Christ, the seed of the woman. In that way, I can be reconciled unto you. And then, everything that we ever lost in Adam, we now can receive in Jesus Christ, our Redeemer our savior the seed of the woman you can rise up on your feet and you can talk to the lord in prayer rise up on your feet and talk to the lord in prayer you need to pray we've learned much today we've learned much today and we need to take it to the lord in prayer have you been tempted by the tempter have you been yielding to temptation have you seen the way now to overcome temptation and are you willing now to take the path of righteousness so you will not be falling and rising, falling and rising every time? Won't you be cleansed and washed in the blood of the Lamb? Won't you take the way, the way of escape that God Himself has made for us so, so that we can always be free from sin? Wouldn't you come to the Lord through the seed of the woman, our Christ, our Messiah, our Savior, our Lord? so that we cannot be fully reconciled unto God and live a life that is glorifying unto God. The Lord is calling you back home. Through His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, the seed of the woman, today you can come and you can have fellowship with the Lord. And if you remain faithful, if you remain true, obedient to the Word of God until the very last day you spend on earth, then you can go to heaven at last and be in that place better than the Garden of Eden. And have a relationship with God in heaven that will never be broken anymore. Because Satan will not be in heaven. Temptation will not be in heaven. Sickness will not be in heaven. Affliction will not be in heaven. Backsliding will not be in heaven. You can endure to the very end and say, Lord, help me. And eventually you will get to that place. A place better than the Garden of Eden. And you will spend eternity with the Lord. Years, hundreds, millions. Eternity will just be rolling by. And you will forever be with the Lord. Get prepared and pray so that 
you will not miss, the rapture will not miss the opportunity of being with the Lord forever and ever and ever. The people that sin, the people that do not repent, the people that go on sinning, on the other hand, will be forever and ever suffering in the eternal lake of fire. Burning with brimstone and burning with fire. But you can call upon the Lord and say, Lord, I want to spend eternity with you. And the seed of the woman has made a way whereby you can turn away from sin, be reconciled unto God. You can receive the grace to live a righteous life all the days of your life.